today I've got a speaker that best value flat out. It's, it's about $935 USD, but you're going to have to pay about $200 shipping. It's going to bring it up to about $1,135 per pair. At that price, it is still bar none, the best speaker you're going to find. And honestly, it beats speakers that are two, three, four, and even five times the cost. It is the Asylab C6B passive bookshelf speaker. The specs are as follows. This is a two-way bookshelf design featuring a passive radiator on the back. The tweeter is a one inch aluminum ceramic dome tweeter and a large waveguide. The woofer is a six inch aluminum ceramic cone. The crossover frequency is 1.1 kilohertz. Sensitivity is spec at 85 decibels. Impedance nominal is four ohm. Now the dimensions for this are 40 by 20.3 by 26.5 centimeters or 15.7 by eight by 10.4 inches. The weight is 8.4 kilograms each, which is roughly about 18 and a half pounds. This speaker comes in a few different colors. They come in a standard format for $935 in black as well as white. You do have the option of having different waveguide colors. And as far as I can tell, that does not cost you anything extra. So then you wind up with white with these options and black with these options. You can see I've got this gloss finish gray and that's an extra $200. If you've watched my channel enough, you know that I'm not hyperbolic. I don't say things that I don't truly believe in. So if I say a speaker is the best at something, then I truly believe it. Having reviewed about 120 to 140 different bookshelf speakers ranging in price from $100 to $15,000 per pair, I can confidently say that these speakers at $1135 per pair shipped to the United States are the best value you're gonna find and again, they rival and best speakers that are as much as five times the price. They are that good. And at this price, they are without a doubt my favorite speaker that I've heard thus far. The linearity of the speaker and the overall timbre of the speaker is very neutral. In fact, there wasn't any qualms or issues that I had when listening to the speaker. Everything that I threw at it, Nora Jones, Michael Jackson, Dire Strait, rock music, jazz music, everything, even rap, this speaker played well. Now, I will say that the only factor about this speaker that really kind of lacks is its SPL output capability with respect to distortion, as well as it will need a subwoofer, but it's a passive bookshelf speaker. You can't really expect it to play down into 40 hertz without losing sensitivity. Now, let's talk about the soundstage width because that is probably my favorite aspect about this speaker. I mean, when I'm shopping for a speaker, I want good linearity, I want good even dispersion, and I want a wide soundstage. The interesting thing about this speaker is that my impressions of its overall width don't quite match up with the data. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail when I show you the data for it later. However, the really interesting thing about this speaker is as it gets to the higher frequency area, it actually starts to expand in radiation, so it gets a little bit wider. And that's very unique to this speaker. And in fact, I don't believe that I've come across a speaker that does what this speaker does in that regard. What that means is if you have a piano, for example, and it's panned hard left, you're gonna hear that piano's notes from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency in that one place. Whereas with many other two-way designs, you're gonna have an issue where the crossover or the high frequency begins to narrow in radiation. What that means is if you had that piano, at some frequencies, it's gonna be panned hard left, but then at other frequencies, it's gonna be a little bit inside the soundstage or shifting somewhere else. And so you don't have that constant width. In the same vein, one trade-off that you probably already are aware of is Imaging focus, so focus of the images in the soundstage. For example, a guitarist, if they're there, they should be there. Now, unless maybe they're recorded to where they're larger, but let's say, for example, that guitarist is supposed to be pinpoint. If you tow a speaker out to get a wider soundstage, you're gonna typically cause some diffusion of that guitarist. So they're gonna sound a little bit wider than, than they should. The flip side of that is if you tow the speaker inward, then you're gonna get more precise imaging but you won't have as wide a soundstage. You don't have that issue with this speaker. You can tow it out and still have precise imaging and have a very wide soundstage, or you can point it directly at you and still have a wide soundstage with precise imaging. In my listening, I tended to find that setting the speaker about five to 10 degrees off axis worked best for me. 
That was the best trade-off between the overall high frequency balance and the soundstage width, but I did not sacrifice imaging at all. The other aspect about having this very consistent horizontal radiation pattern is that the images within the soundstage in terms of depth layer extremely well. And honestly, I don't think I've come across another speaker in about a year that does this as well as this Asai Lab 6C, C6B does. I mean, it's just, it really is on another level. And when I use the term game changer, which I don't think I've ever legitimately used in a video, I mean it. This speaker is a game changer and I think it's putting every other brand on notice. The performance and the sound that you get for this speaker at $1,100 per pair shipped to the United States is, it's unmatched. Another great feature about this speaker is its vertical radiation. Now, many two-way designs have a narrow radiation in the crossover region, which is gonna be typically around two kilohertz plus or minus an octave. You don't have that issue with this speaker. This speaker has wide radiation clean through the crossovers. For example, most two-way bookshelf speakers, it doesn't matter if it's a dome tweeter on a flat baffle or if it's a waveguide, at around 2K or so, you're gonna have a squished in soundstage. Meaning that if you stand up, everything's gonna fall apart in that region. So any of the attack, any of the dynamicism, and just the clarity of the vocals is pretty much gonna disappear. With this speaker, you could stand up and still hear those same things. You don't have to put your head in a vise and listen just like this. You have the benefit of vertical radiation being relatively wide and horizontal radiation being very consistent as well. And this is another factor that speakers in this price range just don't give you. The limitation and output really for this speaker is just gonna be in the mid bass, the mid woofer area. Using a subwoofer is gonna allow you to get low frequency content because these speakers roll off around 50 Hertz in room, which for a bookshelf speaker at this price is kind of typical. And I will say that it's probably enough for most people who just listen to music to be okay. Now, personally, I would want more extended bass. So I would need something that gets me down to at least 40 Hertz in room. And then I would still probably want to supplement that with a subwoofer. Part of my listening test is to compare a speaker that I'm reviewing to a known reference. And my known reference currently is the Audio First Fidelia kit bookshelf speaker, which retails for about 1150 US dollars, and then maybe add about $50 or so for shipping which basically puts that speaker right in the same ballpark price as the Asai Lab. Now comparing these side by side, there were a few minor differences that I noticed, but for the most part, they sounded very similar. The one thing that I noticed about the Asai Lab was that there was a little less meat in the lower mid-range area compared to the Audio First. Now the Audio First tends to have a little bit more meat in that lower mid-range area. Some of you may like that, some of you may not. But really, we're splitting hairs here at about like one decibel or so. This is not a big difference. The other thing that I noticed about the Asai Lab was that in female vocals, you tended to have a little bit more air. And then the same thing with cymbals and hi-hats. You tended to have a little bit more air. Now, the data backs this up, so it makes me feel like I'm not completely crazy. Those things aside, the thing that the audio first does that you may enjoy, or maybe you don't, is that it sounds larger. Even in mono with these two speakers sitting side by side, you could definitely tell the overall presence of the audio first was just larger in space. That might work for a larger room or where you have more varied seating left to right, but for a more reflective room, that may be a con. So this is something to consider if you're looking at either of these speakers. Another direct competitor to this particular Asai Lab speaker is gonna be the Kef Concerto Q Meta. And that's another speaker that I really enjoyed. I would say that that Kef is gonna sound darker than this Asai Lab and certainly even darker than the Audio First. The Audio First and the Asai Lab are gonna sound a little bit more uh, detailed, maybe a little bit more resolution. Now, typically when I use those terms, I'm talking about brightness and I'm talking about a boost in the high frequency. And the reason I say this about those two speakers is because relative to that Kef, which I would call maybe a dark sounding speaker, those two sound brighter. I don't like bright sounding speakers. So I wanna emphasize that when I'm talking about relative differences, those are strictly relative. If you're coming from something like a Focal or a Martin Logan, or maybe even a clip speaker, those tend to be brighter overall. 
they might have two to five decibels of high frequency bump. And to me, that's too much. Now that's not overall across the board, but that's kind of based generally on what I've seen so far from those brands, from my own listening and my own measurements. Let's switch gears to the audio clip demo. The purpose of this demo is to provide you with an idea of how much the speaker is changing or altering an original sound. Now the idea isn't for you to go, oh, this speaker has a wide sound stage through my speaker. That's not the point. We're talking about just in terms of timbre, how does it alter the sound? And the idea here is for you to listen and do you hear a difference between the two? The less difference you hear, the more accurate, the more neutral the reviewed speaker is. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, now let's take a look at the data. This is the frequency response and the black line is pretty much what you heard. If you were listening, you should have heard no difference through the mid range and you might've heard a difference in the top end. Now you'll notice the top end is falling off and you may be thinking, well, then why is the speaker so great? This is an intentional design purpose, okay? The reason that the top end is rolled off a little bit is to make up for the expanding radiation in the high frequencies in that area. The F3 is at 54 Hertz and the F10 is at 35 Hertz. As I said earlier, you can expect to get this speaker down to a kick drum area, but if you want less than that and you want more output below that frequency, you're gonna to need to supplement the speaker with a subwoofer. Here's the CEA 2034 data set. This looks fantastic as well. Good on axis linearity, really good listening window, good early reflections and sound power. And you'll notice that the directivity is really quite good as well. And really what this means is if there's something about the speaker that you wanna change in regards to tonality, then you can just grab an EQ. This is why I say that I prefer to buy a neutral sounding speaker. Do all neutral sounding speakers sound the same and do they measure the same? Absolutely not. There are certainly differences between speakers that are neutral and other speakers that are neutral and those things matter too. But at the end of the day, you're looking for a speaker with smooth frequency response. It doesn't have to be dead flat, but you want it to be smooth. And the reason for that is because you don't want the speaker adding or taking anything away from whatever you're listening to or the television or the movie that you're watching. And if you wanna make that change, you just do that via EQ. That way you can change it back if you get to an album that doesn't sound good with that speaker anymore, okay? This is the estimated in-room response at zero degrees in black, 15 in blue, and 30 degrees in red. Burst decay looks good. You see this little bit of a blip right here, but that's 27 decibels down. You're not gonna hear that. Now we're gonna get into the area where the speaker has made trade-offs. So we start off with the harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, and then we go to 96 decibels. You can see that there's a big bump in the low frequency harmonic distortion. Now this is second order, so it's gonna be a little bit harder to tell this apart, but if you listen to the speaker extremely loud, then you might notice this additional distortion coming up through the mid range. Just as a point of reference, I'm gonna show you the 96 decibel distortion for the Arendal speaker that I just reviewed. It's a $5,900 prepare speaker. And that's what we've got here. Notice how much lower the distortion is in that lower mid range and bass region. If I go back up, see how much higher it is with the Asai Lab? But the mid range distortion for the Asai Lab and the tweeter distortion are very low. This distortion right here for the Asai Lab with a crossover at 1.1 kilohertz is super impressive. What about multi-tone distortion? Here you go. So through the mid-range, kind of at my personal threshold for 96 decibels. So if you're listening below that, you're gonna be fine. If you go above that, then you might start noticing more graininess. For long-term compression, you're losing about a decibel or so of output in the lower mid-range. For short-term instantaneous dynamic compression, this is the result that you get. So if you're listening at 76 decibels and then you increase to 86 decibels, 96 decibels, and 102 decibels, these are the changes in the frequency response. So at 96 decibels in blue, you're, you're, you're still okay. I think you're all right. But when you go to 102 decibels, you lose some mid-range, you lose some bass, and you also lose some treble. And as another point of reference, this is the Arendal again. Now keep in mind, this Arendal is almost six times the price. So now let's look at impedance. Now this is the area where you need to pay attention if you have a weak amplifier. With a minimal impedance of 2.6 ohm right through here and a minimum EPDR of 1.2 ohm in this region, you are gonna want an amplifier that can drive a forum load without any trouble. 
And I would definitely recommend an amplifier that has you know, the standard 100 watts or more. To summarize, at about $1,135 shipped to the United States, this is the best speaker you're gonna find. If you're interested in me doing a comparison video against the Audio Fidelia or Audio First and that Kef Concerto Q and maybe another speaker like the Ascend Audio uh, Sierra V2, let me know in the comment section below. If I get enough requests for it, I'll take the time to do that at some point. If you like this content and you'd like to see it coming, please consider doing a few things for me. Take the time to leave a like and leave a comment in the comment section below. That definitely helps the algorithm. Also, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, and I provide behind the scenes information, early test results, and I share stuff there that I do not share anywhere else. You can also use any of my generic affiliate links below. So let's say you need to buy something from Amazon, you click that generic affiliate link and you buy whatever it is. That earns me a small commission at no additional cost to you. With that all said, I'm gonna bail out. I hope you all take care and have a good one. Peace.